and try it again in 1812, but maybe we'll talk about that. That's another lecture series. Or Yeah. So how do uh, the Continental Congress plays into all this? Uh, so what comes of all that and what causes this first meeting? Okay, so the American colonies, and it's not just Massachusetts that's beginning to rebel. We've seen some action in in uh, New Hampshire and Rhode Island. Virginia is really getting upset with the mother country at this point, as well as some of the other colonies. And the colonial leaders in the various colonies, we can't call them states yet, but the colonies, they realize they need to work together. We had seen the... Uh, Stamp Act Congress in 1765, but it really wasn't that well attended. They need some kind of central body to, to give some overall leadership to the colonies. This will be the closest thing to a central or federal government that we're going to have for a while. So it's called the Continental Congress. Virginia and Massachusetts, which were the two most populous colonies and the two most rebellious, I guess, or at least the most influential rebellious colonies, they send out a call for a Continental Congress to meet in Philadelphia, and 12 of the 13 colonies sent representatives. All right, uh, not anybody want to guess? Who wants to guess which one did not send a representative? Anybody know? Uh, I think our. Uh, do you know, Scott? <laughs> uh, do, I think I see a hand back there. Do you see it, James? Yes, I do. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I'll give you a hint. There was a Ray Charles song about this this state or this land Ooh, little geography it's, quiz yeah there okay it's georgia oh georgia man i'll tell you what georgia had a lot of loyalists at this time they are eventually going to get on board with the cause but not quite yet okay so the congress meets and they endorsed the suffolk resolves and i don't know that we mentioned the suffolk resolves i, I can't remember if we did gosh it's been a week so much has happened but <laughs> But the Suffolk Resolves were uh, a statement in Suffolk County, Massachusetts, made by several of the Massachusetts Patriot leaders. And they declared uh, the rights of the colonies against the British uh, government, especially regarding taxation. The Congress declared that Britain had no right to tax the colonies, and they agreed to meet again in May 1775 to reassess the situation. One other very important thing they did was they agreed to boycott British goods beginning in 1774, December of 1774. This boycott was very effective. Imports from Britain dropped 97%, 97% in one year. That's like almost completely gone. And that really hurt the British economy. This wasn't the first attempt to boycott, but it was the most effective one. Um, So, In response to what's going on in Massachusetts, General Gage dissolved the Massachusetts legislature, and they just went a little bit west and reconvened. They just ignored him, and they said, oh, we're going to meet anyway, just not in in Boston. And the general didn't have a lot of authority outside of Boston, so they just continued their their, uh, actions, and they called themselves the Provincial Congress. Gage began to hear rumors that the colonists were stockpiling weapons and gunpowder at the town of Concord. So, uh, and this was a big cache, cache or whatever you want to call it, a big, a big supply. He, so Gage wants to get hold of this stuff, this gunpowder, these weapons. So he begins planning a mission to seize the weapons and the gunpowder. And he also heard that two of the key rebel leaders, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, were staying in the town of Lexington, which was on the road to Concord. So Gage decides, well, I got to have the supplies. I've got to have the gunpowder, the weapons, and maybe I can bag these other two, these leaders too. And and that'll hopefully put an end to this rebellion or at least damage it severely. One other thing too, there's a lot of really interesting things that come out with the Suffolk resolves where trade from Great Britain, and that includes Ireland and the West Indies, are boycotted, and this seems to be very effective. Here's my question. The reverse thing, again, we're comparing to the Civil War, where the Confederacy sees the beginning of the end when it's cut off. There's a shipping blockade. Also, after the siege of Vicksburg, they really don't have much access west of the Mississippi, and this is what cripples the Confederacy. But it seems like the colonists bring this upon themselves and it seems to do really well for themselves. So what's the difference here? Are they just better at living off the land because they're in a pre-industrial economy compared to the Confederacy? Or is there something else you think? 
Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Well, I don't think so. We, we, there's a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, the main crops that were exported to Britain were very different. And at the time of the Civil War, it was cotton. So in 1861, the Confederacy boycotted, or actually not boycotted, but they declared a ban on exports of cotton to the Confederacy. Um, and they thought, well, the Britain needs our cotton so badly that this will hurt their economy so much they'll just beg us to lift the uh, the ban on exports, and maybe they'll come help us too. Um, in this case, it's tobacco. So different, different, uh, and tobacco is such a big cash crop. This it's a different crop situation. But another thing that's even more important is that. By the mid 1800s, like by 1850s, 1860s, the British Empire had expanded so much that they had plenty of other places where they could go and plenty of other colonies where they could go and grow things. Um, so, uh, for example, when the South cut off the cotton, well, the British said, OK, fine, we'll just go grow cotton in India. We'll grow cotton in Egypt, which that the wasn't a possibility in 17 in the 1770s. I don't I'm not an expert on the agriculture, but I don't think you can grow tobacco in Egypt and in India. And, and I don't even I don't think the British control over those areas was quite as complete as it was uh, later. In other words, the British couldn't just turn and say, well, we'll plant our tobacco in Egypt or in India. Um, they didn't have as much control over those lands. And again, it's a completely different crop, different type of soil. So they just they weren't able to replace that source of tobacco like they were in in the 1770s like they were able to replace the cotton market in the 1860s does that make sense yeah thanks for explaining that because there's lots of little things like this that i think when i was first learning these things in public school i let slide but now i'm curious about them okay so britain is being pushed into a corner, forced to show their hand. So Gage is ready to do that. What happens next? All right. So he wants, as I mentioned, he wanted to capture the uh, supplies, the gunpowder and the weapons and the ammo that was in Concord that the, the, he thought the colonial leaders were uh, storing up, hiding. So he puts together a small force. He puts a man named Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith and also Major John Pitcairn. Pitcairn is a Marine. Uh, <laughs> Semper Fi. In charge of a force of 800 light infantry and grenadiers. Uh, light infantry, I should say, is different from regular infantry in that it just it doesn't carry as much stuff. The average British soldier carried a lot of gear, a lot of equipment. They were really weighed down. Light infantry traveled lighter, and they were able to move faster. They were people who were more physically fit. Uh, of course, back then, you and I have discussed this on another podcast, but they didn't have boot camp. You know, they, they didn't have guys running obstacle courses and doing five mile runs and doing the uh, yeah, jumping over walls and doing the pull, what, what the monkey bars. <laughs> they didn't have any of that. They they didn't train physically a whole lot. They instead they drilled and they they just made sure that they could fire their weapons, which is very complicated. But anyway. Um, these light infantry guys, these were quick, fast, light-footed guys. And then you had grenadiers. Grenadiers were another special type of unit that their original job was to carry grenades, primitive grenades, of course, not like modern-day grenades, but the equivalent of grenades. But eventually they just kind of morphed into infantry who were very tough, you know, just kind of like big, strong, strapping guys. So – almost like heavy infantry in a way. So you've got, uh, and, and normally these these types of troops were a part of each regular regiment. So, and again, I, I don't want to steal my own thunder. We'll talk, we'll go over this more systematically in the next uh, discussion that we have. But for now, let's just say if you had a regular regiment, you would have a light infantry company within that regiment and a grenadier company within every regiment. But what Gage did is he, stripped those off from different regiments and made it a force of all light infantry and grenadiers. Very interesting. So um, the thing that was interesting about that is that they had not fought together. 
Okay, so these 800 were not used to working together. They hadn't really trained together, at least not. I mean, the ones within the individual companies, of course, had, but uh, the, the, between companies, there had been no previous collaboration. And Smith and Pitcairn had not commanded these men before. So they hadn't had time to get to know each other yet. And this is going to lead to a lot of confusion later when fighting breaks out. All right. On April 18th, a group of 20 men galloped out to secure road crossings and to prevent Patriot Express riders from warning the militias at Lexington and Concord. But, of course, they're not completely successful. Smith and Pitcairn, they didn't want to come through Boston Neck because it was being guarded. It was just too dangerous. They didn't know where Patriots might be. They might be hiding in the hills or somewhere, and they might shoot at them. So instead, they secretly, they thought secretly, got in boats, and they ferried across the Charles River. And the Charles River is just to the west of Boston. Remember, Boston's the big ping-pong paddle, <laughs> the great ping-pong paddle. <laughs> And um, they go across the water and they land in Cambridge, which is uh, on the mainland. Although some sources say they landed on the Charlestown Peninsula, which is to the north. But anyway, regardless of that, they got onto the mainland and they decided to march the rest of the way. Patriot spies were all over the place. They warned the militias in the surrounding towns. The militiamen were called Minutemen, by the way, right? Everybody's probably heard of Minutemen because they had to be ready on a minute's notice. They had to be uh, just ready to jump up, grab their hat, grab their gun, and go. Now, Paul Revere, who we talked about earlier, he was monitoring the activities of the British Army. And he had made arrangements for a signal to be placed in the Old North Church. And this is the famous one if by land and two if by sea incident. In other words, uh, I, I forget the guy's name that he had do this, but... It doesn't really matter. So if the British went by land through Boston Neck and around to the west, or first north and then west, there was going to be one lantern hung way up high in the Old North Church where everybody could see it. If they went across the water, it was going to be two lanterns. And, of course, they went across the water, so two lanterns were hung. So that way, Revere and the other spies knew which route the troops were taking and roughly how long it would take them to get there. In Concord, the residents began moving the military supplies out of town. And on April 19th, famously, two express riders, Paul Revere and a man named William Dawes. You know, it's, it's sad, uh, Scott, because Dawes never gets any credit. I bet nobody's ever heard of William Dawes. They ha I'll mention why no one knows about him a little later. But yes, there okay. were two of them, but no one knows about him, just Paul Revere. Yeah, Revere gets all the, all the f fame and the glory. But anyway, it's because of that poem, doggone it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Revere and Dawes, they gallop out of Boston. They head to Lexington and Concord to warn the militias there. At Lexington, they were joined by a third writer, Samuel Prescott, or Prescott. An Prescott, by the way, just fun fact on the side, Prescott is an ancestor of President George H.W. Bush. How about that? So he uh, Prescott is, is one of the names in Bush's family lines. I thought that was interesting when I learned that. Huh. Anyway, Revere and Dawes reached Lexington. They roused Adams and Hancock. They said, "You got to get out of here. here the, you know the British regular troops are coming." And I don't. I seriously doubt, by the way, that Revere said the British are coming. The British are coming. He probably said the regulars are coming or the redcoats are coming. But who knows? <laughs> Uh, I mean, technically, th these guys are British, too, right? <laughs> yeah, they're all anyway, subjects. I mean, they see themselves as different, but they still see themselves as British subjects. So, I mean, I was raised, I think, in elementary school. They told me that he said, the British are coming, the British are coming. But that's doubtful. All that's right, anyway, so they they reach Lexington. They get Adams and Hancock moving. And they Adams and Hancock flee into the into the woods. And the Lexington militia comes, calls up and gets ready to meet these coming British soldiers. Now, they rode on to Concord, the second town, and between Lexington and Concord, Revere was caught. Dawes turned back, but Prescott escaped, and he made it to Concord. So Revere, uh, contrary to what some people may think, Revere didn't make it all the way on the ride. Uh, Samuel Prescott finished the job. Revere was captured and eventually was released, but... But he wasn't able to complete the ride. But anyway, the point is, is that the message did get to Concord thanks to Samuel Prescott. 
And as the regulars marched, the regulars mean 